Um, we appreciate you being here. It's, this is the town council meeting of Tuesday, August 20th, 2024, here in the Yucca Valley Community Center, Yucca Room. And we will get started here with a uh, call to order and roll call. Council members Abel. Here. Dennison. Dennison here. Droz. Here. Schooler. Here. And Mayor Lombardo. Present. Um, <clears throat> let's stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, and we also have with us Grumpy Keller of the Joshua Springs Calvary Chapel, who is going to be leading us in invocation. So please stand and repeat the Pledge of Allegiance with me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing. Pastor Keller. Good evening. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this evening, and Lord, we just thank you for all the gifts you give us. We thank you for this town. We thank you for the people that step up. In Proverbs 11, verse 14, in the contemporary English version, we read, A city without wise leaders will end up in ruin, and a city with many wise leaders will be kept safe. So, Lord, as I, as I pray here tonight, I lift our town council to you, Lord, that they will look to you for wisdom and guidance, Lord. We thank you for everything that they have put in place, and as they look towards the future of Yucca Valley, I ask that you keep all first responders safe. And Lord, we thank you for everything you do again in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you. Okay, be seated. Do we have any presentations, introductions, or recognitions? Mayor, we're uh, privileged this evening to hear from Assistant Chief uh, Villarino. Going to give right. you an update in the community, an update on uh, San Bernardino County Fire and the activities that uh, we have here in town. Very good. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, first of all, I had the pleasure of having coffee with the mayor this morning. I want to thank you very much. Anytime I can get with the community a little bit on a, on a personal basis like that, it definitely helps us out, spread our message. Um, and show the collaboration between us and you guys. So thank you very much for inviting me. It was good, thank you. Um, you guys all know me, if anyone doesn't know me, I'm the assistant chief for the area, the Morongo Valley area, uh, all the way out to Needles from this, from here all the way out there. We have six stations, uh, two boats out on the water in Needles and Lake Havasu um, that are super busy this summer. They've been uh, quite busy. So uh, maybe one of the, the next times I give an update, I'm gonna bring some of the pictures of the boats and the activities they're doing just to, to take a look at some of the stuff they're doing. And um, it's, it's gotten pretty interesting. I didn't realize how busy our boats were until we got out here and I took a look at it and realized um, they're on that lake all day. Half of that lake is California side and all the shoreline is ours. So big responsibility in our division we have. Um, but out here in Yucca Valley to give you guys a little update, I just put a quick PowerPoint together um, and to answer any questions for you guys and kind of say what's going on with the county. So a couple of things I'm gonna go over, just some operational changes, some of our staffing stuff we've done recently, um, our recent promotions, you guys have seen a few of them. The call stats for the Echo Valley area for the month of July. I put our uh, picture of our new headquarters up there and then some of this new Station 41 stuff coming that we've been working uh, hard as a, and collaborating in that as well. <clears throat> so uh, new headquarters, best picture I could find. I had a, real, a much better picture. I, I, my savviness with the PowerPoint is I just couldn't get from my phone to there. Um, and so I got that one up there just to talk about it. But, you know, our headquarters, uh, Councilman Dennison could attest, with, we had an old building that we've had since before I was hired, and I'm not sure if, you know, what, what it was before. But over, over 25 years, we were in a building, and, and we outlived it. Um, and we were able to, uh, they were able to put the funds together. We rehabbed an old building in San Bernardino near the airport and uh, came up with this large two-story building that we were able to get our entire, um, all of our operations and everything under one roof, which was a big deal to us. We had our fire marshal office in another place and our prevention people somewhere else and, um, and everyone was spread out right here. We have our human resource, our, our fire marshal office, um, all of our chiefs are there um, at the upper level staff. I have a satellite office there as well um, and it makes things a lot smoother for the operation of County Fire. So County Fire at a quick glance, Division 1, uh, if you don't know, it's the West Valley area, includes Fontana, Upland, Division 2, San Bernardino, Grand Terrace, some of the un unincorporated areas. Division 3, the mountains, uh, Crestline, Forest Falls, 
Division four is what we are. We got Yucca Valley, 29 Palms, Needles, and then the unincorporated areas, Joshua Tree, and all the way to the state line. Division five is the North Desert, Hesperia, Atlanto, and the unincorporated areas up there all the way to Nevada state line. Both those, the both deserts we have are just huge of square, square mileage. So we have, these are what I'm talking about putting things under the same roof. We have our EMS division, our fire marshal office. We have a wildland fire camp. So that has our, has our fire crew. We have our own dozers, um, heavy equipment from loaders to uh, um, dozers, loaders, and uh, excavators. So we have someone on, on, on site there 24 hours a day that we can utilize them. We bring them out here if we need them. So if we need to take some buildings down that are dangerous to the community and we can't get with um, maybe code enforcement and, and it's nighttime, we can bring them out to make that environment safe. Um, unfortunately, when our fire engines get stuck in the sand, <laughs> uh, we have to get them out too. We'll bring the dozers out for that as well. Um, and then obviously any wildland fire uses that we can use them for. So it's a great asset that we have there. Uh, training division and then obviously our warehouse. Our warehouse is not under the same roof um, because they have such a large uh, area that they need to supply stuff with. So they're actually just down the way. Um, there are managers there, but they, the rest of the warehouse is somewhere else. So some of the staffing plan we put together, we were really short staffed um, and every agency is across the nation. It's not, it's not county fire. It's not just the county sheriffs. We are all short staffed and having a hard time recruiting. Um, and so we put together a pretty aggressive plan a year ago and, and we've just finished it up and we're still behind, but we really put a big dent in it. And some of the things we did, we had a lot of promotions going, so we had a new deputy chief come in, um, Martin Cerna, he came from the outside, he, he was the Torrance fire chief, uh, now he's our deputy chief. Um, three assistant chiefs, I'm one of the new promotions, I think I'm about almost on my seventh month now since I uh, came out here with you guys. And we had two others, one for San Bernardino, Gary Yeager, and Jason Serrano went to the mountains. So a lot of changes, out of five assistant chiefs, we replaced three of them, um, and that was out of retirements and attrition um, that we replaced those open spots. Seven new battalion chiefs and two division chiefs, all in the last few months of all those promotions. We received two of them. You guys have met Travis Seguiri. Um, the other one is Jeff Allen. If you haven't met him, he, when he's on duty, I'm gonna try to get him out here so you guys can meet him as well. Um, and then we have some more, we have four more battalion chiefs to still promote. Um, and we're getting, we're developing another captain's test right now, another engineer test. This year we did the two towers back to back. Uh, we did a tower of 44, graduated them, tower 17. We did a tower of 35, uh, tower 18, and they were back to back. And they're about 10, 11 weeks long and um, completed those guys. Those, are on, those guys are on the floor now. Um, and we're currently recruiting for tower 19, which will start in January. So we try to do as many as we can just to stay up on it because you immediately fall behind with retirements and attrition and, and growth as well. We did add some new positions throughout the county this last year. Um, in this division, we added a fourth person to our fire engine in Needles. Um, and that's just because of their location. Um, and <clears throat> with uh, being by themselves out there, that extra person definitely lends them a, a hand when they have no one else coming in, unless they're coming from across the state. Any help from the California side is coming from um, uh, 29 Palms is their closest engine. But we also have good agreements with uh, Mojave Valley right across the way. So for July, this is our Yucca Valley area, right? Um, June and July, we had a, definitely an uptake in, uptick in fires. So we talked about it a little bit. I've talked about it before. And I think a lot of that was that we just had a, a pretty bad heat wave. We couldn't, there was nothing that came back to arson for us with any of our investigators that we knew of um, that was, it looked like any type of um, consistent activity with that. But uh, for the most part, you know, 443 calls for the month uh, in Yucca Valley and most of those, you guys know, that we have two stations here in Yucca Valley. We have 41s and 42s, and 41s is right here in the, the downtown area. They're the busiest ones, so they take the biggest part of that. There are fire, one uh, engine and two ambulances run out of there. So um, they're the busiest, and then up on the hill, they have, we have 42s, and they're not quite as busy. But this is the total for all of them. And then down the line, you just see the different uh, calls there. Public service, traffic collisions, electrical incidents. Um, so it's nice to kind of look back and see where, where the guys were, but uh, generally it's a pretty busy area for, for, for us um, in, the, in the town here. It's, it's Station 41 is um, comparably busy to our other stations other than our metropolitan areas. What classifies as an improvement fire? That could be anything from um, homeless encampment type fires, any, you know, they'll just classify there as an improvement fire. Um, yeah, it could be almost a nuisance fire, anything like that, backyard fires um, or bomb fire, stuff like that. Okay. So the, one of the biggest things that I've been working on and I've been, you know, working with uh, 
uh, town council and, and staff. Uh, it's New Station 41. When I came in here, uh, took over for Chief Tuttle, and you guys know this has been something that's been in the works for a couple of years and trying to find land and, um, and move forward with the process. I feel like we're in a good positive direction right now moving forward. Um, I just got notification a few days ago that the piece of property directly behind the station is now actually ours, um, physically ours, so we're good there. We're in the, um, these are the different phases of it. So site selection, prelim design, we've completed those. Schematic design, completed that. Design development process, um, that's kind of where the structural part is, to make sure that we had this good idea of this building, can it actually be built? And so the engineers are looking at it, and they've had to tweak a few things. Um, and now we're kind of starting to talk about budget. So I've I had a meeting today, I have an ongoing every bi-weekly meeting uh, with the architect and our, through the county, it's our contract services who kind of oversee the construction projects. And uh, we're getting to the point of starting to talk about budget. Uh, we were given money uh, into the account uh, prior to me coming out here, uh, but I think we already know, and the way time goes, it's things, things are expensive. And I, I don't know how else to put it. Stations used to cost a couple million dollars. Fire engines used to be a couple hundred thousand dollars. A new fire engine I mentioned this morning is seven, eight hundred thousand dollars. A ladder truck's a million and a half. And the, the hardest part is when we need new equipment, uh, it's two to three, four year waits for, the, for them to even build it and get it to us. So um, it, it's hard. The stations now are, are costing 15, 20, upwards 30 million dollars, depending on size, location, and, and what, how you build them. So, it's a, that we're in the, now we're in the tough, uh, the tough phase. Um, I know what our budget is and now we have to try to get into that. Um, and I don't see anyone knocking down my door giving a bunch of money away right now. So uh, we're just gonna have to do what we, what we need to do to get into budget. Uh, construction docks, we're hoping if nothing, no big delays, December we can do that. Plan check in March and we're hoping to with, uh, award the bid in July. That's, that's a perfect schedule. So. You know, go looking at the properties, we're having it site surveyed to make sure to see what the groundwork and, and what they're gonna need to do with the elevations um, and the dirt and the, um, the runoff and stuff like that. So w as we get that stuff back, we'll be able to have more information there if anything's delayed. This is our prelim uh, design is what we're looking for. Uh, kind of the shed roof style. Um, you know, the, the siding and the color scheme, we're not sure on yet. Um, some of that stuff is, can just be uh, done later. Uh, but it's, we're looking for three bays is the biggest part, and then the small bay is for the battalion chief. So again, in a perfect world, we want uh, our, our companies there. Right now, again, we have a fire engine, two ambulance, that's seven people, and a battalion chief, that's eight, uh, eight people. And we also have additional equipment there. We have a, a brush engine, a vegetation type fire engine that we house there as well. Um, and then I'd like to have a spot to bring the ladder truck that's up at 42 downtown is, is my goal. So that's the third bay right there. That's just another view coming from this side here. Um, that's the living quarters and with an entry over there. And some of that will be dressed up. That, again, it's this basic design and, and we've talked about maybe even doing some type of entry walkway into there um, to make it more aesthetically pleasing. Fire Explorers is another big deal. Again, I'm talking about um, recruitment and, and you know I keep pressing the message and, and we're pushing hard on this one. So we got these out to our high schools right here, this flyer here. Um, we, we want people from our communities and, and I have nothing against the other counties, but when we hire people from other counties, they generally go back and live in their counties. And that's just, it's, na it's, it's natural. Um, we're comparable pay to a lot of the other counties uh, for the cost of living here. And what happens is if we bring someone from Orange County, they end up going back to work for Orange County. They're hiring as well. So we really want people out of our own communities. We're in all of our, we used to have a large explorer program and it kind of went away with COVID. And actually, not kind of, it really did go away. Um, we lost it and, and they, they, it exists barely. So out here, it did, um, it did go away. So we have some new captains that are, are gonna be in charge of it. And then Travis Gary, the battalion chief is overseeing it. Um, and to get out there and really try to get this message out. And so again, back to connecting this morning, I was able to connect with a couple of people from, uh, that have kids in high school that are able to get, you know, I'm gonna get them the flyer and, and, and get the word out there and get the message that, that we're looking for. We want a big group. And it's not even if they plan on being uh, firefighters, we're really just looking to be with the community. And, and then if they do become one, um, they're, they're coming from our communities. They might not work out in Yucca Valley or 29 Palms or in Morongo Basin. Maybe they choose to work in San Bernardino to be a busy city. 
But if they live in this county, they're probably gonna stay working for us. And that's kind of what we're looking for. We have a tendency to train people up pretty good and spend a lot of money on them. And then they end up, uh, they leave. And, and it's not too often, but the biggest thing is to keep them from basically what we call cradle to career. Uh, and kind of like our, you know, Chief Muncie. Chief Muncie has been his entire career here and he's the fire chief. So he's been every rank and that's a, that's a perfect scenario, right? So that's kind of what we're looking for is, uh, to kind of get our hooks in, in our high school kids. And this last thing here, um, we've been trying to, we've been getting some more traction with this. Had a lot of recent fires, vegetation fires. I'm sure you guys watched on the news, the San Bernardino one that was pretty devastating. We lost some homes there. Um, it was a big deal. It is a big deal. It's heart wrenching. Um, you know, when you go to the town hall meetings and you see afterwards and the people that lost their, their homes and they they were the ones on TV and they're, you know, they, they're animals and stuff like that. And, and it's tough for us um, as well as everybody in the community. And, and some of the biggest thing is uh, we've had this program for a little while and it just hasn't got a lot of traction and we're really trying to spread it out there. And what it is is uh, any community member can call the phone number, set up an appointment and they can leave a message or talk when they, Monday through Friday, there's someone that'll answer the phone. And one of our fire engines will go out there and go through this list with you and talk about your clearance and talk about some of the things around your house. And really it's just some basic items, but people kind of forget. I mean, we all do around our house. I, I do, I'm guilty as well. I got my firewood a little close to my house, I'd probably uh, guess. Um, and, or you let your, your weeds get a, a little higher than they should be. Or the ladder fields. The ladder fields are a big deal. People don't realize your trees growing all the way to the ground or any of your bushes. Uh, the fire hits that, just climbs right up and goes into your house. And unfortunately what happens is we evacuate you with the sheriffs and we get everybody out of there, but no one saw that little spark that landed up in your, your eaves um, and your house burns down because there's nobody there. We evacuated the area. And so the best thing you can do is just to take care of your own property and really get that out to the, to the community. And so. We've been pushing this back out again. It's been out for a little while and it didn't seem like it had a lot of traction. I feel like it's unfortunate, but you get some devastating news on the TV and it, it starts to kind of relive again a little bit. And so um, we're starting to get some of the calls out here to make some appointments for our engines and we're more than happy. Our captains and crews are more than happy to go out there. It doesn't take long walk through the properties um, and just talk to the community about you know, some of the things they can do to try to prevent it, um, prevent that. So um, I brought a few of these flyers here, but they're, most of the stuff's all on our website, uh, www.sbcfire.org. They have links to, the, um, to this stuff here, um, as well as I believe our Explorer stuff. In a nutshell, for a few minutes of your guys' time, that's, that's a kind of a quick overview of County Fire. Um, I appreciate the time to do it. I don't mind doing it anytime, you know, any maybe quarterly or something, get up here and give you guys some updates and, um, and answer any questions. Is there anybody in the public wishing to ask any questions? I did pick a nice night that was kind of quiet tonight, so it was a little <laughs> easier down. crowd. I feel like the last meeting I didn't, there was an empty chair, so <laughs> a little easier. Pay them to stay away or whatnot. <laughs> no. Thank you for your presentation. No problem. I'm going to sneak out of here. I have another something else to go to, but I, I, I don't want you to think I'm leaving because I, yes. I just want to say one thing, Chief. Uh, thank you uh, to Chief Gary for, uh, he had mentioned that he was very uh, proactive on the uh, Explorer program. And I'm oh, glad yes. that that's already been started. It's a great time. It's a new school year. I yeah. saw that the school had their disclaimers on the bottom. So he obviously went there and yes. started and engaged. And thank you. Absolutely. I think it's very good to, uh, to get those kids when they're young, especially at the beginning of the year, they can put that into their schedule and hopefully participate in the program. It's a great program. It is a great so, program. And so that's really the only entry level into the fire department now. And before, you know, we started, there was different on-call, paid call, volunteer service. And not a lot of departments have that anymore. We uh, don't either. Um, the Explorer is our way in, you know, the way in. And, it, and it, like I said, if it's not, if you're not going to be a firefighter, it's still a great, um, you know, just a character building and, and so an organization to belong to. And it always looks good on your resume. So. Absolutely. But I it's an so. awesome career. Yeah, I... Uh, Pass that on. Thank you. I will. Uh, I would say that getting the uh, ladder truck back here in the middle of the town where it's really needed is really imperative. Yes, sir. Um, and uh, also, um, aesthetically, you know, uh, being on the highway, uh, I know we're not in a fluent area, and I've seen county fire buildings that are awesome and beautiful and and i just don't want the county to think well it's just yucca valley we'll just put up a metal shed out there and uh, and put a fire truck inside so aesthetically i'm hoping it's a an attractive building and it's also very practical it's long overdue i don't know if we're the oldest fire station in the county but it's pretty close to being the oldest so uh, thank you for all your effort and help thank you for your support it's really nice to see it coming together and taking that next step absolutely yeah. We've been waiting a long time. Anybody else? Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Have Stay a good night. Safe. Town, thank you. 
All righty, on to the consent agenda. Uh, all items listed on consent agenda are routine matters of or formal documents covering previous town <coughs> council instruction. <clears throat> items are enacted by one motion and a second without separate discussion, unless a member of the town council or town staff requests dialogue on a specific item at the beginning of the meeting. Requests for public comment on the consent agenda item should be filed with the town clerk, Leslie over there in the corner. Um, and so we have items. Uh, Mayor, before that, I would like to make a motion to approve the agenda as presented. Oh, that would be appropriate. Yeah, that's right. I'll make that motion. Okay, thank you. Mayor, I'll second. Okay, we have approval in a second. Council members Abel. Yes. Dennison. Yes. Droz. Yes. Schooler. Yes. And Mayor Lombardo. Yes. All righty. So there are items one through eight on the consent agenda. Is there anybody in the public that wishes to speak on any of the items in the consent agenda? Has anybody filed any paperwork? Anybody online? Quiet night. Okay. Mayor, if there's no further questions, I'll move to uh, approve the consent agenda as presented. Very good. Second. All right. We have approval and second. Council Member Zabel? Yes. Dennison? Yes. Droz? Yes. Schooler? Yes. And Mayor Lombardo? Yes. All righty. We're on to department reports. Uh, c code compliance annual presentation report. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'd like to introduce this evening Robert Thompson and Yolanda Perez. This is your code enforcement team uh, that works in the community um, in a number of different areas. They're here tonight to talk about the, the staffing levels, the program, um, where the requests for service come from, and a little bit about the processes. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Robert, Robert and Yolanda. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Council. Please excuse my voice as I'm battling a sore throat. Um, my name is Robert Thompson. This is Yolanda Perez. And tonight we'll be presenting the um, Code Compliance Divisional Annual Report for 2023 and 2024. Those are the uh, Code Compliance Division hours of operation. The, <clears throat> excuse me. The uh, Code Compliance Division staff uh, matrix. We have one full-time code compliance officer, which is myself, <clears throat> and then one full-time code compliance technician and administrative assistant, which is Yolanda, along with all the additional duties that she does as well. You want to read this? <clears throat> want to explain our goals of the town of Yucca Valley School Compliance Enforcement Division. Um, our ultimate goal for Code Compliance Division is to work with in partnership with the community members to preserve and enhance the safety and appearance and ethic, um, economic, economic stability of our community. The most significant benefit our, of our partnership with the community is the el el elimination of hazardous blight and deteriorating conditions that contribute to unattractive, unsafe, and undesirable residential and commercial neighborhoods that negatively impact surrounding properties. To accomplish this, the town administers a fair and unbiased code compliance program founded on the town of Yucca Valley Municipal Codes. These municipal codes cover issues from zoning, public nuisance, and pro um, property maintenance issues to short-term vacation rental, operational standards, requirements, and business registration regulations. Code enforcement personnel works with community members to correct and solve any code issues as they arise. The ultimate and primary goal for the Taniaka Valley's Code Compliance Division is to is compliance, not punishment. But when no path to compliance is being met, code will and use administrative and civil tools to enforce town municipal codes and ordinances. How code enforcement cases are reported. These are the percentages. We have field observation slash internal, 31%. Other agencies, 28%. <clears throat> property owners, 2%. And community members, 39%. Code compliance process from the time of the request, um, from the time the request comes in to when I get out in the field and verify the violation. It's about three to five business days. Once the violation is verified, code compliance is, code compliance will open and send notice or penalty uh, within seven days of the violation being verified. 
each notice and penalty issued has 21 days um, to correct or to establish a path to compliance with the property owner. In most cases, owners or responsible parties, <coughs> they are cooperative. We, they can work with staff on extensions um, regarding the notices. So the 21 days isn't just a, that's it. If they're making progress, we can work with them and, and give them extensions on those 21 days. Here's a fee schedule for the penalties. First fine for the unit. The first paragraph is the municipal code violation fine matrix. First penalty is $100. Second, $200. Third is $500. And down below is the building and safety fine matrix. $100, $500, $1,000. Again, if violations aren't corrected within 21 days of the date, um, if they are corrected within 21, 21 days of the date, the fines can be dismissed. Here's the short-term vacation rental fine schedule. Uh, first penalty is $1,500. Second, $3,500 within 12 months. And the third penalty, is 5,000 within 12 months. All fines are subject to interest that are all directly related to investigative and administrative costs as well. Here's the highlights for the 2023 2024 report 279 total complaints reported, opened cases 324. Inspections, a little over 1,500 inspections were conducted. Closed 231 cases. And then penalties and notices that were issued, 860. Here's physical year comparison for 21, 22, 22, 23, and 23 and 24. Idea of how things are moving. Weed abatement. Permits required for construction, camping or occupancy of temporary structures, non-permitted short-term vacation rentals, rental operational violations, and then the street and sidewalk vending. Here's some progress pictures for code cases that we were dealing with. One on the left, that's the corner of Yucca Trail and Joshua Lane. Kind of look like a jungle out there. And then on the right is the highway in front of Chipotle. Residential property maintenance, commercial vehicle parking. This is another code case that we worked diligently on to correct. There were parking semis, there was junk trash and debris, along with a lot of other issues on the property, as you can see up above, and then the progress down below. <clears throat> Here's another one, a vacant lot, squatters, junk trash and debris, and commercial vehicle parking. This was on a coma, just behind Jelly Donut. Commercial property. Here we had some individuals living inside a vacant commercial property. We worked with the property owner to get it all cleaned up, boarded up, and abated. Recommendation that the council receive and file the report. That concludes the presentation this evening. Staff would be happy to answer any questions following public comment. Is there anybody in the public that would like to comment? Is there anybody online? No. Okay. Uh, back to council. Anything? Go ahead. I, I noticed that during your presentation there was an uptick in short-term vacation rental noncompliance. It looks like it's gone up and down a little bit for the first two uh, uh, periods, but the last one it's up to 45. Um, can you tell us about how that's happening? Is, do you see anything or reason or just the a decline in the short-term usage? 
why they're falling out of compliance. I think a decline in the um, usage of the short-term vacation rentals. Um, that could be an issue. I can't think of anything specific that's causing that uptick. Um, and, and that's not the operational violation, right? That's the non-permitted. Or not permitted because we had so, an issue with that at the beginning, which got us to really begin to look at short-term vacation rentals and, and the, our uh, development codes and compliance. So we got a handle on it and now that little bit there. So I think the staff on the permitting side of the fence, not the enforcement side, but on the permitting side, what they have seen over the last 12 to 18 months is a large number of properties have sold and transitioned. So you've had new operators coming in who may not have been aware of the permitting process, so they were operating without permits. I think that's the most likely cause, okay. is the sale of those units and them either needing to, before they sold, to transfer, because that is uh, an eligible action now, or not going through the transfer process and operating without a new permit. Well, thank you, and, and thank you very much on your work. Uh, the Acoma, you brought that up in the presentation, and also the building there just uh, on the highway just east of that area. Uh, that was another area that was uh, quite vandalized and squatting. So thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Great presentation. Thank you very much. Can you bring that slide back up on the violations again? Um, so I have several questions on that. Um, So first of all, you have a very tough job, both of you. It's not a very envious job, and thank you for doing it. Um, it's a lot of heavy lifting and dealing with some disgruntled people and trying to uh, become or remain professional when people don't treat you in a professional manner. So I don't think I don't think it's a hard job. It's a tremendously tough job. Anybody dealing with consumers and especially when they're in violation is is, is really rough. Um, you, you're dealing with quite a volume for a staff of two people. Um, yeah. Is a lot of the backlog or a lot of the or I wouldn't say backlog is is a lot of the the um, stress in the back end where you're having to fill out reports, answer calls, and make. Uh, uh, send out notices or is it on the front end where you're having to be out in the field, you only have a Monday through fr uh, Thursday schedule for a limited amount of time, there's only one of you. So where is some of the possible needs in those two areas? Do we need more people in the back or in the front? Well, I think it's in the front end or Yolanda's end rather. Okay. I She's do. getting pulled in a million different directions. Yeah, I'm in I'm in community development um, su um, staff support as far as you know reception and answering calls and doing that stuff. So it's pretty much probably in the administrative um, part where I do get backlogged. Okay, so a lot of the uh, the paperwork it's very paperwork oriented. Plus you're pulled in a lot of different directions with different work. Um, when you get a short term vacation rental operation violation. How do you become aware of the violation? Is it the noise complaint? Um, what is that? A couple different ways that we get notified of a complaint. It could be a phone call. It could be a walk-in. It could be a host compliance complaint on the website. Um, so there's a couple different ways that we get notified of those complaints. Um, and if it's a phone call, Yolanda obviously tells me. If it comes in via email, I'm notified of it. But it comes in in a couple different ways. So, yeah, I got a report of one particular Airbnb had like eight violations. And I'm like, why is that person still got a permit? Why are they still operating with eight? And of course, you give them, we give them time to uh, deal with those. And then perhaps you have to put like the noise monitoring equipment and so forth, those types of things. So it's, it's, it's somewhat of a uh, neighborhood complaint or somebody calls in saying there's a problem, a violation of too many vehicles and so forth. Um, the sidewalk vending, it only had two. And I know sidewalk vending's all over the place in Yucca Valley. It's gotten a little better. I think you've gone out there and talked to like several locations and they put a stop to it. But now what I see is now they've moved to dirt areas that's not in front of a business and they're still working at night. So is that something that we might have to contract out to have somebody dealing with the uh, nighttime violations? So, so just want to make a few comments on that. Um, many 
times your street vendors are not going to have identification. Um, when we make contact with them, they're going to indicate they can't speak English. Um, and it's a very difficult uh, enforcement issue for just code enforcement. The um, organizations in Southern California, what you're seeing today is a, a concerted effort between code enforcement, police or sheriff's departments, and county health departments in terms of a unified sweep in addressing those problems because code enforcement can't deal with it all on its own. Um, so what we had most recently done, uh, because typically they'd show up on the same property, we ended up having to go after the property owner. And that seemed to have addressed a majority of the issues. We now see the little more mobilized and dropped off at their location and they don't have their own vehicle, the fruit salesman at different intersections on the dirt roads. And we stop and make contact. We give them a certain amount of time and Robert can talk about that, pack up, get out of town, um, and that's been our, our most uh, reasonable way of addressing that compliance issue. You want to make any more comments on those? So, exactly. During the day when I see the vendors out, I address it immediately. I stop, I talk to them, let them know they have to pack it up and move on. <clears throat> um, the problem with that I've been running into is when we hold the property owner accountable, for example, they have 21 days to correct the violation. Well, the food vendor's gone the next day yeah. and they move to another property. Okay, so we dismiss that fine. We hold the next property owner accountable. They're gone the next day and they just kind of bounce around. Um, so yeah, that's I kind can of see the problem that. that I'm running into. Yeah, I can see that being rather difficult. You know, I always felt the uh, sort of the preventive uh, measure, I don't know if, if you're even open to flex scheduling where you're, you know, you come in a little bit later and stay a bit a little bit afterwards because, you know, Friday, Saturday night, you know, we can almost clockwork, they're going to start setting up around 5.30, whatever, 5 o'clock. It's almost when they start to set up to say, nope, you can't be here, uh, don't, I don't need to call the sheriff's department, do I? You need to move on. Uh, and eventually, um, preventing them from setting up is much, much easier to deal with than at once they're set up, then it becomes a very complicated uh, situation. Um, I know that you also been working a lot with weed and abatement, especially along the main highway. I appreciate that. I've seen some major improvements on some of the properties. Of course, we still have major retailers that are still uh, lax in that. So um, again, I appreciate all your efforts. It's a tough, tough job. So thank you. Couple, couple additional comments back on uh, Council Member Abel's first question. Your typical code enforcement or code compliance officer's time is typically around 60% field, 40% office. The, the documentation that's necessary in code enforcement has to be adequate enough to withstand judicial review. And so documentation, documentation, documentation is very important in, in their process. So in terms of staff time, um, there is quite a bit of office time involved. Then when you get into cases where the property owner is not compliant and you actually have to go before a judge and ask for the inspection warrant, go out and perform the inspection, then you have to go back and request the abatement warrant all of that requires staff time to prepare those documents. So you may end up pulling your officer out of the field for three days out of a week just to prepare one case to present to the court. So it can become very complicated and can really pull that off, that one officer that our current structure has away from those daily, daily routine duties. Um, we did just do a sweep on the highway. Yolanda, Robert, myself went out and made a sweep down the highway Monday morning. Um, the highway is looking relatively good. There are always going to be problem properties. No matter, no matter how hard and aggressive we are, there, are always, there will always be one. And then with the high temperatures and the weeds that come back. But uh, Robert and Yolanda have been doing a very good job of addressing those highway issues. I attended a, uh, a conference. I believe it was the uh, city county conference. And they discussed uh, street vendors and I believe it was uh, in a, maybe Apple Valley or some other jurisdiction, um, they were confiscating the equipment. So like the, the vendor cart, it was mostly carts, and they were, they were finding that it's kind of like um, 
they had a ringleader that basically owned all the carts and these people were just being taken advantage of because they stand there for a very minimal wage right. and sell the product. They don't get to really keep much of the proceeds, but they bear the brunt of when code enforcement comes and they lose their equipment and their product and it's all taken away. But it seemed to be very effective. Um, and they said that they had a lot it creates a little bit of problem because the owner of the cart has to come to claim it to get it back and if it's not done within a certain amount of time those carts are destroyed and um, there were some legal complications but it sounded like a very effective way of dealing with it because word gets out pretty quick oh you don't set up in that area because you're going to lose your equipment and it's expensive so city of fontana is kind of one of the leading agencies in in our region that implemented that type of ordinance but it's not one of their first steps they actually have multiple steps of education and outreach well, I agree. and they and they first. document each time they work with a specific vendor and i want to say it's only after the third time of interacting with that vendor do they then go into the confiscation mode they are being legally challenged. I don't know if it's worked its way through the court system yet or not. I doubt it. Um, but they are being challenged on that. And a number of cities in the Riverside, San Bernardino County areas, they are all in the process of revising their ordinances and looking at alternative ways because it continues to be a growing issue that all of the cities in the county areas are dealing with. Okay, and we'll be kept informed of what the... Absolutely. If there's If there's a need for considering revisions to town codes, we'll definitely be bringing those matters before the town council. Thank you for your attention to that. Thank you for your efforts. Welcome. Anything else? Thank you so much. We'll receive and file that. <clears throat> Item number 10, berm repair and replacement project approval of plans. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, now to the fun parts of this meeting. So, uh, so the project before you tonight is town project number 9103. Make sure, yes. Uh, that is the perm repair and replacement project. And this is, thank you, authorization to advertise for construction and receive bids. So the town council adopt the resolution, that recommendation, approving the plans and specification for the berm repair and replacement project and authorizing the town clerk to advertise and receive bids. So the town council previously saw this project with the adoption of the fiscal for 24, 25 budget and the five year capital improvement program that we discussed a few months ago. The project consists of installation and replacement of a rolled asphalt berms throughout town. The berms were damaged due to rainstorms events, typical wear and tear over years of roadway use. Um, the town have approximately 25,000 linear foot of missing damaged berms within town limits. The, this project, this project is, have prioritized some of the areas because unfortunately we cannot address all the areas because of funding. So we are addressing at this point of time 95, 59 locations that is amount to about 9,000 linear foot of missing berms. And I apologize, the, um, the list that went out with this package have some areas were duplicated between both citizen request and town staff request. So that's have been cleaned up as of, and the advertisement will go for the right amount and for the right places for this, uh, for this project. Um, so the schedule for this is we are releasing the beds as of tomorrow. It will be released. We will have that in our website and also we'll be sending all of these documents to our, to the plan rooms, which is where the contractors usually go to see what bits around and what's going on with the construction wall. The bid and bid will be opened September 26 at 2 p.m. And we will be reviewing the bid between September 27 and October 4th. 
and the estimated award of the bid for this bid will be October, the, the meeting of the October 15, 2024. So budget for this project is we have, uh, we are having a fund 350 development impact fund of 250,000 for this project and fund 515 highway user tax fund of another 250 for a total of 500,000. And that is, you know, the est our estimation for what are we putting out for bid, it comes around 480 grand between the construction, between the, um, uh, and contingency. So with that is the recommendation in front of the council tonight that the council approve the, adopt the resolution approving the specification, perm repair and replacement project, and authorizing the town clerk to advertise and receive bids. That concludes staff reports and we'll be more than happy to answer any question that, you, that the council has. Thank you. Is there anybody in the public wishing to speak on this uh, berm repair project? Anybody online? Nope. Okay. So, town council, any questions? I just want to make a comment. I want to thank staff for moving this one forward. Uh, we do get a lot of requests throughout the year, especially post floods, yeah. uh, about the concerns of berms and water flow down our streets and into our yards and homes. So, this is something we've been working on for a while. I appreciate you bringing it out tonight. And I'm excited to see this move forward. Thank you. Great. Anybody else? Alex, you said there were uh, 59 locations selected for this project. Yes, for uh, that. How for, many, for this phase. How many remaining locations are there? Um, well, the, I do not have the actual, um, you know, count. But we are like, if we are addressing 9,000 uh, linear foot of berms and that would the remain will be about 16,000 left. So, so by math could be like more than more than more than half. 100, okay. Yeah. 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 120, okay. 130. Yeah. Okay. But right. again, you know, I, I can get you the right amount. Just, just curious. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. Anybody else? Okay. I'll entertain a motion. Mayor, I'll go ahead and move uh, item number 10 on the agenda for Town Project 9103 forward. I'll second that. Council Members Abel? Yes. Dennison? Yes. Droz? Yes. Schooler? Yes. And Mayor Lombardo? Yes. Okay, item number 11, Civil Engineering Services, Design Services, authorization to release a request for proposal for the Yucca Mesa and Buena Vista intersection improvements. Town project number 7073. Uh, Mayor, the recommendation before you tonight that the town council authorize and release the requ uh, of a request for proposal for Yucca Mesa and Buena Vista inter intersection improvement design. So this is different than the one that we just talked about. This is for design services. And also this project, the town council previously saw this project with adoption of the 24-25 budget and the five-year capital improvement program. And the project is that the intersection between Yucca Mesa Road and Buena Vista Drive are showing a sign of deterioration as a part of the designated truck route. It seems like, you know, truckers like to use that because they can avoid the grade on the 247, and that is used heavily by trucks all the, so that deteriorated and that, you know, that is daily commute of residents only, residents only that is contributed to the deterioration of that. The engineering staff has indicated that current road conditions will soon become a hazard and have discussed a possible solution to mitigate it. So staff has determined that the widening of this intersection as well as upgrading the existing pavement to concrete instead of the actual asphalt will help improve the condition for years to come. So with that being said, that is we are actually releasing the request for proposal tomorrow, August 21st, 2024. It is due to the asked for review, um, September 26, 2024 at 3 p.m. The review proposal will be between 27 to, to October 4th, estimated award of the RFB for the design a uh, contract will be on October 15, 2024. It could be the second meeting, you know, maybe the first meeting of November, depending how long we will take to evaluate the um, proposals that we will be, that we'll be receiving. Um, 
The budget for this is $100,000 included for, the, for that improve, for that, um, for that design of that. We have not yet allocated construction funds for it. We will wait till the design is completed, figure out what is needed, and then we'll come back to the council for recommendation on the funding to construct. This, this 100,000 is actually has been offered to us by Major I, the town Major I that is we receive from San Bernardino County Transport, SPCTA, um, the, uh, this, you know, the, for, for, for the Major I funding for the town. Um, oops, sorry. Oops. Well, so the recommendation for the council tonight that the council, the town council authorized the release of a request for proposal for Yaka Mesa Buena Vista intersection improvement design. That concludes staff report. We'll be happy to answer any questions after Very public comments. Very good. Thank you. Is there anybody in the public wishing to comment on the Buena Vista? and Yucca Mesa Road Improvement. Anybody online? No? Any council member have questions? Go ahead. I don't have a question. I just want to say uh, I think I'm really excited about this because I live near that area. And I've been waiting to turn right on Yucca Mesa, and a big truck comes, and then you have to back up because the corner is so narrow. So I'm really glad this is being done. Thanks. OK. Anybody else? Yeah, Alex, if I may. Um, there's two different uh, graphics that are provided in the agenda item. Uh, that's very heavily trafficked. We're getting a lot of trucks and larger loads that are unable to navigate that tight turn without crossing into oncoming traffic. So mm -hmm. I've noticed the design cur smooths out the curve, makes it more approachable for that. Uh, one of the designs shows it just as a T, and then the other design doesn't show it crossing the county split on that, not an improvement looks like to the east. Uh, so I didn't know which one was more correct of the two images. Will it be uh, improvements on all four approaches to that intersection or just the three that we currently use primarily? Only the three that within the town limit. Okay. There, there oh. is no county area that including this project at this point of time. Okay, so that east section from the, our, the, the yeah. town line will town not is. have improvements to it. So, so there will be, you do a little bit of imp improvement because you need that improvement to protect the edge of the asphalt. So there will be a little bit of work on that side. All four corners um, will, will have something. So there will be a little bit because vehicles coming across there, we don't want them to destroy sure. that asphalt road. So there will be a little work, little work there. Are we, Thank you very much. Are, are we at all trying to interface with the county to see if they're willing to complete this? So, so, it's so all, the way? all the legs of this intersection, um, in terms of the existing improvements that are, are there today, are all within the town. None oh, okay. of that is county jurisdiction. Okay, very good. Oh, there's a wash there as mm -hmm. well. Okay. All right. Uh, that concludes that. Is there a motion? Mayor, I'll go ahead and uh, move forward item number 11 for civil engineering design services on the item discussed. That'll be for project, uh, town project number 7073. I'll second it. Okay. Council members Abel? Yes. Dennison? Yes. Droz? Yes. Schooler? Yes. And Mayor Lombardo? Yes. Um, <clears throat> on item number 12, I need to excuse myself because the Macris Park improvements are my next door neighbor. And so I will have our uh, Mayor Pro Tem Droz lead the discussion right. and questions. I'll do I, I need to leave, leave. Okay, come get me. I'll be in the back eating. <laughs> All right, let's get started on item number 12, Macros Park. So concrete and playground replacement project, town project number 8053 authorization to advertise and construction and to receive bids. I better put on my glasses. <clears throat> so do we have a, a presentation? Yes, Mayor, uh, so Mayor Pro Tem and Council members. The item before you tonight is the town project number 8053, which is Macris Park Concrete and Playground Replacement Project. And the recommendation before you tonight that the town council adopt the resolution approving the specification for the Macris Park concrete and playground replacement project and authorizing the town clerk to advertise and receive bids. This is also a project, 
prior review that the council, the town council previously saw this project with the adoption of 24-25 budget and the five-year capital improvement program. And the project consists of the demolition <coughs> of the existing basketball court. And we included a picture here to see how the, the condition of that uh, basketball court. And you know, the, uh, with the new concrete based on existing dimension and apply 40, about 4,300 square foot of court servicing on top of that to make it a little bit appealing. And the project will also include the removal and replacement of existing playground equipment at the park. This equipment, these playground equipment been in the park for, the la for at least 25 years. And you can tell from the picture they're missing uh, swings and missing equipment. So we are replacing that as part of this, uh, for th of this project. So the release of the bid will be tomorrow, August 21st. The bid will be due the 26th uh, of September at 3 p.m. We will be reviewing the bid, and the estimated award of bid will be on October 15 of 2024. Um, just we would like to highlight that is the um, the funding for this project is covered by Major Y. Uh, we have the Miracle League field service replacement of $150,000 that is go gonna go on soon and the Macris Park concrete and playground replacement of 200,000 for a total of $350,000 for both projects. So the recommendation that the council adopt the resolution approving the specification for the Macris Park concrete and playground replacement project and authorizing the town clerk to advertise and receive bids. This is conclude staff report and will be more than happy to answer questions following public comments. All right, thank you, Alex. <clears throat> Is there anyone in the, uh, in the audience that would like to comment on this, either in person or online? Anybody? <laughs> yeah, we're doing a show here, audience. Now, anyway, in the public. Okay, um, anybody, uh, any council members want to comment on this? Uh, Councilmember Dennison. If there's uh, no additional uh, discussion, we've had this uh, presentation through our CIP, uh, so um, I understand the needs, and I think it's a safety concern too. So I'm very excited to get this moving forward and the improvements to it. So I'd be happy to move forward uh, item number 12 for Macris Park, uh, Town Project number 8053. Anyone else want to speak on that or a second? No, I would second it. All right, we have it. Council members Abel. Yes. Dennison. Yes. Schooler. Yes. And Mayor Pro Tem Droz. Yes. Now we'd like to call back the Mayor of Yucca Valley. <laughs> yes. There's a cookie on your shirt. <laughs> Cookies are good. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so uh, item number 13 then. Welcome center roof replacement town project number 5009 authorization to advertise for construction and to receive a bid okay and this project is the uh, california welcome center uh, roof replacement project and the recommendation before the town council tonight that the council adopt the resolution approving the specification for the california welcome center roof replacement project and authorizing the town clerk to advertise and receive bids. So the town council previously saw the same project on the 24-25 budget and the five-year capital improvement program. The town has an ex existing agreement with the Desert Regional Tourism Agency to staff and operate the Yucca Valley location of the California Welcome Center. The town-owned facility is in need of roof maintenance. The project will be consisting of removing the, dis the disposing an existing roof system and installing an adhered thermoplastic PVC felt backed membrane roof system is the same roof system that we will be applying it on the aquatic center. So that is proven to be la long lasting and that is a 20 to 25 year of warranties on that. If anything happened, it will be, they will come and fix it. Uh, the current roof system has, an exhausted, has exhausted its useful life and replacement is needed to avoid any water, future water leaks. So we are re releasing the beds as of tomorrow. 
Again, we'll be receiving the bids back in September 26th at 2.30 p.m. We will be evaluating and the town council will be acting and awarding the project on the October 15, 2024 uh, council meeting. Um, again, we would like to highlight that as the funding for this project came from Major Y funding. Um, that is the Major Y have allocated $250,000 for this project to be completed. So that is our estimation for the roof to be replaced based on other bits that we received and bits that I've done before in other agency. Sorry, came in about $187,000 for the project. So the recommendation before the council tonight that the council adopt the resolution approving the specifications for the California Welcome Center roof replacement project and authorizing the town clerk to advertise and receive bids. Conclude staff report. We'll be happy to answer any question after public comments. Is there anybody in the public wishing to speak on the roof improvement for the Welcome Center? Anybody online? Back to council. Anybody wish to comment? Oh, necessary work, and we're happy to be improving our town. I'm a firm believer in those membrane roofs. I have one on my dental building, and it they work seems amazing. to be they work amazing. wonderful. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, moving on. That's... Uh, Mayor, I'll wow. go ahead and move the item uh, as uh, item number 13 on the agenda for the Welcome Center roof replacement. Um, for approval for project uh, number 5009. I'll second. Very good. Council members Abel? Yes. Dennison? Yes. Droz? Yes. Schooler? Yes. And Mayor Lombardo? Yes. All righty. That ends the that portion of it. Uh, any future agenda items anybody would like to discuss? Um, <clears throat> I would like to have a discussion on things we can do that might help make more affordable living um, spaces by changing, um, I guess it would be uh, either zoning or uh, our rules that allow only one ADU per property to uh, include maybe a I would like to have public comment on, you know, uh, discussion and that sort of thing on whether it would be appropriate to have uh, larger properties with the ability to have other structures on the property besides the one home and one ADU. If the owner lives on the property, would it be appropriate to have other smaller rentable spaces for people to get more affordable housing in our environment? Um, I want to know the pros and the cons. I'm not sold on the idea yet, but... Uh, yeah, I was approached earlier today about um, what uh, I guess a lot of people call uh, the, uh, the type of housing for workforce housing. I know a uh, city that I'm familiar with do, does a lot of workforce housing type of things, um, and it was in regards to uh, trying to attract uh, people in the medical field and also uh, teachers uh, to the district. So they were hoping that maybe we could have a discussion on workforce housing to where it's a little bit different than our senior housing type of project, but it might encourage uh, some, of the, uh, some of the medical support staff as well as teachers or teaching staff uh, to have an affordable alternative. Um, so that was uh, actually brought up to me earlier today. I, I was also discussed with me uh, at a, to a, an extent where they were talking about um, <clears throat> these smaller rentable spaces. So if that would be anybody else, we need three to have that a future agenda. But I, I think we need to discuss the ideas and find out if there's any depth to it. Yeah, yeah. If there's any type of funding or availability for uh, housing. Um, our park rangers need places too. Or, yeah. You know, oh, yeah. There's so many opportunities for it. Even just our kids coming out of high school need rentable spaces that they can afford, you know, five to eight hundred dollars a month. Yeah. And, and, and they move up. And if uh, some zoning changes could make it uh, a project where there's businesses on the bottom and 
um, apartments above. Yeah. If it takes a couple of zoning changes to get some of these buildings that are abandoned that could be used, I'm thinking over there by the uh, High Desert Star <laughs> building and that kind of thing. Um, I, I'm a, I'm okay at seeing if there's any funding out there. Uh, obviously, we can't do all these projects that we're working on, but it'd well, be nice to could, see if there's availability money. We can change the environment the 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 rules so that those things are possible and we need to find out if it's desirable you know I, it makes sense to me but i'm not um, mayor if i may so. um i've been having some discussions also on uh, different types of housing projects so I, I would be interested in hearing from staff also on some of the possibilities of changes that we that would help us to develop those types of models that you've spoken of you know yeah. here there, there's a couple of good reasons to have them, like we were saying, to get qualified help in the area and have a place to stay uh, and get going, or whatever the, the goal would be for it. But zoning is a big part of developing. And as our economy changes and prices have risen, and, and I think it's, it's difficult on some of our senior citizens that do have property that are in a situation where they aren't allowed to have any more rental space, that this uh, changes in the rules might allow them to put another mobile home or a, a, some kind of a living uh, area to add an additional rental income so that they can prosper in their own property. Mayor, it sounds like you have consensus to at least have an informational item brought back to you. And then I think from that, you may be able to glean some information of the breadth of uh, your, your right. current development code how it's impacting, and then we can also provide you information about um, input that we've received at a staff level that may indicate barriers or indicate that there are no barriers to what folks want to do. That'd be great. So that may be very, 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 very well may be the case. So I think just an informational item to start, and then from there you can delve okay, into right. it further That's if you great. wish. Is there any other future agenda items, anything? All right. Um, <clears throat> Staff public comment. Is there anybody in the public wishing to comment? This is the town council takes this time uh, to consider your comments on items of concern which are not on the agenda. Uh, when you are called to speak, please state your name and community of residence. Please limit your comments to three minutes or less. Inappropriate behavior which disrupts, disturbs, or otherwise impedes the orderly conduct of the meeting will result in your forfeiture of your public comment privilege. The town council is prohibited by state law from taking action or discussing items that are not on the printed agenda. Is there anybody in the public wishing to speak on any item? Is there anybody online? Okay, uh, is there, I guess that's it. So staff uh, reports and comments. Thank you, Mayor, Council, we got a couple updates for you. Alex or Demery have anything this evening? I will, I will leave the uh, Aquatic Center for you to, okay. <laughs> to report. <laughs> you got it. Shane, do you have anything? Uh, Planning Commission has a very busy agenda next Tuesday. Um, they're going to be working on a number of the items that the council has requested. Commercial special events, sidewalk displays, the amendments to the land use compliance review section of the code for landscaping on commercial development. Uh, mobile food vendors and vending regulations. So commission has a busy agenda. They also have um, a CEQA document necessary for one of the town public works projects, as well as native plant permits going through their process. So that's next Tuesday, the 27th. Thank you, Shane. I'm gonna change things up a little bit. Normally I'd have the captain go, but I think we're gonna end with the captain uh, in your report, if that's okay with you. Uh, Mayor and Council, just a couple of quick observations, comments for you this evening. Uh, with code enforcement staff coming and giving you their department report, um, shout out to Shane and his team for, I think that's the last department this year of all the different ones. If you re remember since January, we've had public works and facilities, community development came, talked about planning. Tonight, code enforcement. Uh, we've had animal care and control and building and safety in your last meeting. So hopefully that gives you a flavor of the boots on the ground and what's happening out there. Um, wanted to just briefly give you an update that the Registrar of Voters has completed their letter assignments for ballot measures and things that are moving forward. A couple ones that are of note for your local area. 
Um, the town of Yucca Valley, as the council will remember, put two uh, possible reauthorizations of your existing measure Y and Z. Um, fortunately, both of those measures are entitled with the same letter designation. So they will be measure uh, Y and measure Z on the November 2024 uh, ballot. So uh, that was interesting. It wasn't, we weren't certain if that was going to occur, but that is the way that the county policy was implemented. Measure C will be on the ballot and that's from Morongo Unified School District. Uh, I believe an $88 million bond measure moving forward. So we'll see how, how that moves forward uh, on the ballot. And then the county has two ballot measures that will also be on our ballot, even though they may not directly impact us. The first is the transit occupancy tax increase. That will not impact residents, STVRs, or hotels in the town of Yucca Valley, but it will be on the ballot for Yucca Valley voters to, to weigh in simply because it's a general fund tax and they can use it wherever they wish in the county. The second is related to a charter amendment uh, related to public safety. So both those will be on. So with the, with the ballot being as crowded as it is, I think it's even more important that the town does an adequate job of informing and educating our voters to know not only the town's measures that are potentially uh, for reauthorization, but also the other measures and how they may or may not impact uh, residents here in, in the town. Alex mentioned it uh, briefly, and we're super excited that we got some calls of, hey, what's going on at Brem Park? And, and we see some fencing going up. So that's uh, your Yucca Valley Aquatics and Rec Center project, initial fencing going up around the construction area that occurred in the last couple of days. Uh, you may have seen some construction trucks there as well. SCE is completing their undergrounding project in that same area along Palm and Little League Drive. So super excited about that. You'll remember that we have our formal groundbreaking ceremony on September 11th at 11 o'clock. That press release will be going out early next week. Uh, of course, anybody can come. It's not just for the council, but we'll make sure that the council our commissions, as well as if you go back a number of years, we had the Yucca Valley Aquatics uh, advisory committee. We'll have to go back through there and see how many of those folks are still around, but uh, that will definitely be an exciting day. So we'll make sure that that word gets out uh, to all of the appropriate people. And if there's anybody special that you want invited, uh, just reach out to us, but you can invite them yourself if you wish. I think that's it uh, for staff comments this evening. I think we'll leave it with the captain. He's got some pretty cool things to share this evening. Yeah, good evening, Mayor and Council. Just wanted to end the me meeting on a very positive note and share with you something that we got to do earlier this week, yesterday, uh, here in town. Uh, the Sheriff's Employee Benefits Association regularly hosts shops, Shop with a Cop events all over the county, and we've been fortunate. Typically, we do one around Christmas time where we find some individuals, and feel free to look at these. This is just going to scroll through. Uh, scroll through while I'm uh, talking, but uh, typically the, the association and our fundraisers identifies some families or children in need, and they bring them to our town, and we partner them with deputy sheriffs, uh, probation officers, CHP officers, national park rangers. This year we were lucky enough to be blessed or, uh, with Curtis, and Deb joined us out there at this Shop with a Cop event. So for this event, uh, 40 uh, school aged children were brought to the Walmart and we were each given a $200 gift card to take with one child so they got a couple hundred dollars worth of new school clothes wow. and school supplies and if the the $200 allowed a little special something for themselves mm -hmm. so it was fun to go through overall a very positive experience as you can see I think the a lot of the deputies enjoyed it more than even the kids who were receiving the items but it's a real good way for members of the community to see deputies in this kind of a light. Um, so we, I am happy to say that um, over Christmas time, so it's either going to be late November, early December, uh, our Sheriff's Employee Benefit Association is going to come back to Yucca Valley. We're going to identify 20 to 25 individuals here from the Morongo Basin uh, who might need a little bit of assistance with Christmas shopping. And a lot of times we'll take the the kids out and have them pick out things for siblings and then something for themselves. So we will be coming back, but just it's great to see. We, of course, we had Najee, our tracking dog, that of course we uh, wouldn't have without the town's help. 
and then a bunch of the deputy sheriffs that you guys see around town. So overall, a very positive experience. And when we get a date firmed up, I will share that. We would love to have members of the council come out. It's a great opportunity to interact with some of our local youth as well as our business. Walmart, they're great partners in this, and see a lot of the deputies. We have deputies who work the graveyard shift who a lot of times will hold over or come in on their day off because they really enjoy participating in this event to be partnered with a, a child and watch them do the shopping and help them pick out shoes and whatnot. So. Hey, Captain, um, on, uh, let that uh, slide go through and hit escape when the dog comes up. Just a couple comments on, the, on that one slide. This one here. Um, if you could bring that one back up, that'd be great. Anyways, uh, that little girl, Emily, was the one that uh, myself and Deputy Backer, who is the uh, Najee's handler, were able to take around. Super fun. You can imagine the two of us trying to find clothes for her. It was, it was an experience, <laughs> but it was great. And, and the other thing that was neat, I don't think I told the captain this, but when we were shopping, somebody else came up and said that their, uh, they we're talking to Deputy Backer and just said, thank you for doing this shop with the cop because my daughter long time ago was part of a shop with the cop experience and had the interaction that was super positive and ultimately um, she thinks was the driving force be behind her daughter going into the uh, law enforcement as a career. So wow. uh, super cool comment to hear, from, hear back from that and, and yeah, it was, it was neat to do. It's, it's fun to see. I know you you all know that there's special people in this community, but I saw on at two occasions, and I was busy uh, shopping uh, with a child myself, but I saw on two different occasions, two different couples go up to the gentleman who is the in charge of the event with cash that they had in their pocket saying, I heard what you guys are doing. This is really cool, and I want to contribute toward it. So awesome. it was really a win, 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 and I'm I'm really anxious to see what happens at Christmas, and I really hope some of you might be able to make it out and meet some of these kids. And uh, we usually do it pretty early before Walmart gets busy, yeah. so it's a seven, eight in the morning type thing. I think this time we did eight thirty-ish, but around Christmas time, typically it's about seven or seven thirty. But it's very rewarding. Yeah, I was really sad I couldn't make it. I had a previous engagement, but a couple months we'll do it again. Something I would have loved. Yeah, I'll I'll catch you for Christmas. You bet. Okay. Um, now we're on to Mayor Council Member reports and comments. Uh, Council Member Abel? Nope, nothing, tonight. nothing tonight. Quiet night. Council Member Dennison? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I just want to thank uh, Chief Villarino for coming here tonight and give us an update on a project we've all been hoping for for a long time. Uh, but also, the big part was uh, just similar to what um, town manager was just saying uh, about uh, their kids the youth interaction with whether it's a sheriff's explorer program or the fire explorer program i think they're very valuable and uh, they help in many ways even if they're not going into those uh, lines of work um, i do want to do a special thing right now uh we've had some fires he spoke briefly of it um about little mountain and san bernardino and the problems that they had uh, trying to save those homes and the challenges uh, he broke, talked about the RAP program, which is um, a residential assessment program. The, the fire department will come out and look at your properties if you have any issues, trying to make it safer. And so that's very important that you do that. And, um, and also just get the stuff like online so you can do it yourself. Uh, we've had some incidents of fires out here, so it's always nice to make sure that people are fire safe. The grass right now is so dry that if you walk on it, it just crackles. Yeah. And that's when it's the worst for our entire community. We're all at threat just from possibly one place that is not well tended to. Uh, and thanks to Robert and Yolanda, it was nice to see them. As uh, Curtis had said about uh, staff coming forward during the year, it's one of my favorite times to see that. And uh, Captain uh, Naji, I saw uh, afterwards, uh, the handlers had her over there uh, by the, uh, uh, by in front of the big lots area. And they were, they must have <laughs> set something somewhere and they were trying to get her to navigate and find it. It was pretty cool because she's, she's just like a fish, just swimming around. <laughs> it was a really nice thing, though, because of the, what we were able to invest uh, to help our community, you know, through the funding streams like Measure Y brings these, these very cool things that really help you do your job better and make our town better. So thank you for that. Very good. Uh, Council Member Dennison. Oh, you did it. I'm sorry. Um, schooler. Councilmember Schooler. Nothing. 
Um, Mayor Pro Tem Droz. Uh, thank you. Um, it was it was nice to uh, run the meeting in your behalf. So <laughs> uh -oh, <don't laughs> it's good it. practice. No, <laughs> no, seriously. Um, uh, Shane, I want to mention Shane. Uh, it's so nice you had those presentations for us because everybody wants to see numbers. Everybody, you know, and that way people can actually see how much work the town does. So thanks for having all those presentations the last few months or the last few council meetings. That's really great. Thank you. And the other person I don't mention often I want to mention is Leslie because Leslie does so much for us. It's incredible. And uh, I can't believe the the her workload, how big it is. I don't know how she does it all. So thank you, Leslie. And that's it. Very good. All right. And I, I want to also uh, tell Robert and Yolanda, uh, thank you for coming and giving the presentation. It's always nice to see uh, the employees uh, and, and their workloads understand a little bit more about what they go through on their daily basis. Uh, the report was thorough and really put some numbers to the department and uh, it just, it's kind of impressive how much gets done and it's nice to be aware of it because a lot of what they do goes kind of unknown. And um, it's a, to have such professional people doing that, people that really do uh, care about what they're doing is kind of a very good reflection on the leadership that supports them and uh, I'm very happy with the family that we have here in Yucca Valley that uh, provide services to our community. And uh, so thank you very much. And it was good to get that information. Uh, I'm excited about the fire station and the captain being here, giving us a little, little bit more update on how it's coming along. It's been a very long process, but we're excited. And the, the uh, groundbreaking at the aquatic center should be a pretty neat thing. I'm looking forward to that. That will be a real major landmark for our town. And I think a step that's been long in coming. And uh, it's going to be really spectacular. I'm very excited about that. So thank you. Um, we have the next meeting is going to be uh, the upcoming meeting, the town council meeting previously scheduled for September 3rd has been canceled due to a lack of scheduled agenda items. And the next regular meeting of the Yucca Valley Town Council will be held on Tuesday, September 17th, 2024, here at 6 p.m. in the Yucca Valley Community Center Yucca Room. I will be unable to attend and will have Mayor Pro Tem Droz lead again. Okay. So thank you very much. And we are adjourned. Thank you for coming.